please welcome a dear friend of recipient, Richard Gere, Edward Norton. Good evening. Um, I actually just got a real email from Seth Rogen. Uh, he's been at home for a half an hour and he's in his underwear and already high and laughing at all of us. <laughs> so, um, when, I was, when I was 25 years old, uh, I was doing theater in New York and I, I got brought out here for the first time to a screen test for a film called Primal Fear. Um, and I was so, uh, I was so convinced that, that I wouldn't, wouldn't get it that uh, I was adding up the $75 a day per diem and figuring if I could stretch the stay in Hollywood to four or five days, I could maybe um, cover half my month's rent or something like that. Um, I was, I was nervous, uh, as one is when presented with that kind of an opportunity, and I decided uh, to go and watch some of the films of the star of, the, of this film I was going to audition for, Richard Gere. And I looked, uh, I looked at American Gigolo, and um, I looked at An Officer and a Gentleman, and The Cotton Club, Internal Affairs. These were all films I had seen and been very affected by uh, in my younger years. And I remember thinking that, that this was going to go great because this guy was so, uh, so strong in these types of roles uh, and was going to be so perfect in this role of this slick, cynical lawyer in this new film that I was just going to push everything else to the side and look for that guy and play off of him, and I, I thought uh, it, it gave me a certain amount of confidence um, that, that there was gonna be this anchor uh, in him that I could find and that the scene would go great. So I got to stage five uh, at Paramount, and they had it all set up, and I sat there, I, I kept waiting for that guy to emerge. And um, I looked over, and, and he wasn't anywhere around, and by the camera, instead, they had this guy with kind of long, uh, unwashed hair in a tattered T-shirt with a bunch of prayer beads around his hand and torn jeans. Uh, and I thought, shit, they have pulled some out-of-work hippie out of Topanga Canyon <laughs> and brought him in to read this scene with me because Gear's not going to do this with some unknown kid from New York. And I thought, I'm screwed. Uh, and then he looked up. And I realized that it was Richard, um, just back from Dharamsala or wherever he'd been traipsing around. And he kind of gave me this look and he said, hi, I'm Richard, this is gonna go great. Uh, if there's anything you need, if there's anything you want uh, from me, you know, just, just tell me. And I, I, I was so uh, struck by that and I kind of focused in and we did the thing and uh, and I was lucky enough to get that job. And I tell that story because um, I, I, think there are, I think there are a few things that don't get said enough about Richard. The first is that what's emblematic about that story to me is that, is that Richard has always been uh, a character actor in the skin of a leading man. He's always been, you know, he's a bohemian, he's a singer, he's a, a musician, He's a humanitarian. He's a soft-spoken, gentle, very caring guy who has become iconic for playing almost exactly the opposite. Um, and as a result, people underestimate the level of transformation that he's delivering in creating characters like uh, Martin Vale in Primal Fear. It's so far from who he actually is, and it's incredible uh, what he does to uh, put on uh, that character. The second is, is that he is an unfailingly generous uh, collaborator who, in film after film, makes his co-stars shine and look good. Think about, apart from uh, how good he made me look in Primal Fear, the way that Diane Lane comes off in Unfaithful, the way that Julia Roberts comes off in Pretty Woman. He is always 
the anchor of a film making uh, co-stars shine. And, and that's not just the way the scripts are written, it's, it's the humility uh, with which Richard approaches roles, uh, the understatement with which he grounds them, and the generosity with which he, he acts with other actors. And the third piece of inspiration uh, which I take from him is that as a human being, uh, he has really set the standard, I think, for how you can take uh, the vacuous kind of silliness of celebrity uh, and find something substantive in it and, and make the world a better place through it. He, his work as a humanitarian uh, is, is almost unparalleled. The level of commitment that he has put into his work for Tibet and so many other humanitarian causes, I think is a, is a strong, strong standard uh, and, and inspiration for people of my generation in terms of trying to figure out and navigate this strange thing of becoming well known for something that you do and figuring out how to do something good with it. So I think for all of those reasons, uh, it's very, very fitting to celebrate the incredible career of Richard Gere spanning literally classic films uh, like Days of Heaven all the way through to this fantastic performance in Arbitrage uh, that he gives this year and which I watched last night and is just absolutely brilliant. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to stand in for so many other actors who have had the pleasure of working with him, who have been supported by him uh, and um, encouraged by him. And uh, it's an incredible pleasure uh, to say thank you to Richard for the support he's given me personally and so many others and to present uh, this Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the LA Times, Eddie Hartenstein. Thank you, Edward. Going back to his earliest days, no less than the august publication, the LA Times, described his performance in An Officer and a Gentleman as poignant and beautifully drawn. On his latest role in arbitrage, we said, quote, he should play the bad guy more often. And he makes the study of man mesmerizing. And the gear has quite possibly never been better. So at this time, Mr. Richard Gear, I'm thrilled to present you with the Hollywood Career Achievement Award. Uh, and all of us, Kathy Thompson, Devon Maharaj and all of us at the LA Times know that you're really only just warming up and like us, we're here to stay. It's kind of embarrassing uh, hearing all that stuff. Edward, I gotta talk about Edward a little bit too, because when he came out to do that audition, I was actually leaving the production because we didn't have an actor who could play that part. And we couldn't find anyone in all of New York or Hollywood that was known, unknown, who could play believable as innocent. Actors can be crazy, but to be innocent is really difficult. And I was on my way out, and we got a call from, from Deborah, Aquila. Deborah Aquila. And she said, wait, 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 I found this, this guy. He just had walked in an open audition. And as he said, he came out to, to do a, uh, a full screen test. With, I mean, a full screen test. I mean, there were several scenes and full out, all the, the makeup and, uh, and, and angles. We did the whole thing. It was so amazing. We looked at it and said, it must be some kind of a fluke. We better do it again. And we did it again. It was about two days later. It was equally good, and we said, this guy's a genius. And uh, so I feel very proud that I was in the beginning of your extraordinary career, my friend. Um, it's funny, you know, they, I started getting these, these kind of Lifetime Achievement Awards a few years ago, and it, it's to see, I'm not, I, I'm not aware of time very much. You should ask my wife about that. I don't know, I don't understand time very well. But when you see all the work one does, you said, well, you've been around a while. I don't think I'm old enough to get these kind of awards yet. At least I hope I'm not. Um, but I appreciate it. I appreciate, I want to thank Carlos the Jackal, 
yet again for, um, for this award. And um, uh, all the actors here know this. Careers are not made by one person. I mean, I was trying to count in, in an award ceremony in Rome last year, I was trying to count the number of people that I've worked with on movies. So there's maybe three or 400 people on a movie. I've done maybe 50 movies, so what is that? A couple hundred thousand people? Someone can tell me. That's a lot of people that was involved in you know, these clips and things that you see here. And the awards don't belong to one person. Nobody does this on their own. In life, nobody does anything on their own. So whatever these awards are, they go to everyone I've ever worked with. But there's one person that probably deserves this more than anyone else. And there was, a, there was an award that I was given in New York at the, um, oh, what's it called? The uh, Museum of the Moving Image, about uh, six or seven years ago, I think it was. And I, I, I mentioned this person then, and he was there. And I've kicked myself ever since that I didn't speak more about him. And it's my dear friend and agent, Ed Lamato. I, and this is late, but I'm gonna tell the story anyhow, if you don't mind. Uh, I was, I'd worked in repertory theaters for a couple of years, and I came to the city. Long story short, a, a, I knew um, an agent there because she was married to a director that I'd worked with in regional theater. And uh, she said, look, if you ever come to New York, uh, let me look after you. And, and so I came to New York, and uh, she, I got there, and she said, well, look, I'm leaving now. Um, because uh, she was handling Zeffirelli. Zeffirelli wanted her to move to London. She said, but my assistant is becoming an agent. And uh, I'd love you to meet him and see if that works out. Well, I, I remember very clearly walking into his office, and my hair was down to here, and motorcycle jacket, and uh, a huge chip on my shoulder. And I walked into uh, Ed Lamato's office, and he became my dear friend, an agent for over 40 years from that moment. And the only movie that you saw up here, clip, obviously that were, that were not up there, there was not a decision I made without talking to him as a friend and as, uh, you know, the, the, the way it, the relationship should be of really dear friends. There was no manipulation. There was no silliness involved. I remember the number of times that he cried with me over making a decision of whether I should do something or not. Um, Ed died about two years ago, and um, he was a chain smoker. He was three or four packs a day. It was the, the coffee, the cigarettes, and the and and the telephone. And I. He came from Mount Vernon, New York, and I never visited his hometown, but he was clear, he talked about Mount Vernon a lot. And w w we all kind of converged on Mount Vernon to the funeral, and as we were driving around finding the, the funeral home, all the mailboxes said Lamato on them. And it was a second ge generation Italian, they were Neapolitans, but they had taken over this whole section of, of Mount Vernon. And we went to, to the funeral. The first four rows was the Sopranos. Big black hair, everyone was heaving with emotion, big sunglasses. And then there was a, 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 an aisle. And then the next four rows was all agents and lawyers from Los Angeles in Prada. <laughs> and that's what his life was, was this combination of the Sopranos and Prada. Um, if, if I've had a career of mostly good choices, some really lousy choices along the way, and lousy films, but mostly really good films, and things that I'm deeply proud of, it, it's really because of this friendship and trust that I've had with this really wonderful man, Ed Lamato. So it's for you, Eddie.